Amen. Friends, good morning. My name is Rebecca Lamont. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian. And though we're worshiping from different places, it is good to worship together. A quick word of thanks to those who are helping lead in worship this morning. Chad McLeod and Eric Busco, thank you for bringing joyful music on a rainy day. And thank you to George Ray, our lay reader for the morning, who will read our Old Testament text in just a few minutes. A few announcements about things happening in our life and faith. And if you would take a minute as I say them and let us know that you're worshiping with us, use our text check-in system. If it's your first time joining us for worship, text FIRST, 1ST, to the number 313131. Or if you've been here before, text CHECK-IN, C-H-E-C-K-I-N, to the same number, 313131. As I said, we know people are worshiping from lots of different places this morning or coming back to us later in the week to worship. If we were here together, we would take a moment and greet each other and pass the peace of Christ. Take out your phone or your computer, send a quick email or make a note to make a call or send a text to someone who's on your mind this morning, just greeting them and sharing the peace of Christ. Please mark your calendars for next Sunday, February 7th at 1215, when we will have our annual congregational meeting. We obviously can't be here in person to do it in the room, so we will do it this year by Zoom. There will be emails coming out this week that have the link and instructions for how to access the meeting. And if you're uncertain about that, please let us know. We can do a Zoom tutorial and help you get online, or you have the choice of dialing in by phone to join the meeting. And we will cover all the things we usually do in that meeting. We'll have a state of the church report, a financial report, and we will elect our new classes of elders, ministry leaders, and our new nominating committee. Please be on the lookout for that information coming your way. Our call to worship this morning is adapted from the Psalm for the Day in the lectionary. It's Psalm 111. Let us give thanks to the Lord with our whole hearts, for the works of the Lord are great. The Lord has been gracious and merciful to us, faithful and just. God provides for us and has brought us redemption. God's covenant endures forever. Friends, let us turn our hearts to the worship of our God. For I'm the Lord thy God. God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, the burning bush, the burning bush. God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, said, I'm the Lord thy God. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground, holy ground, holy ground. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground, I'm the Lord my God. Go down to Moses, smite that rock, smite that rock, smite that rock. Go yonder to Moses, smite that rock, for I'm the Lord thy God. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground, holy ground, holy ground. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground. See salvation work, stand still, Moses. See salvation work, for I'm the Lord thy God. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground, holy ground, holy ground. Take your shoes off, Moses, you're on holy ground, for I'm the Lord thy God. Before we 
turn to prayers this morning. I just want to say our thoughts and prayers are with Bill and Tedra Cheatham. Uh, Bill's mother, Jean, uh, passed away Tuesday. Uh, she was 82. Well, let us turn to God in prayer. Graciously, Heavenly Creator, we come before you on a new day, mindful of the rains that fell last night and are falling this morning, rains that you set in motion, water to renew the earth, just as your spirit renews us. We celebrate what you have wrought and who you have redeemed. We know that as your created children, we have strayed from your ways, but in your love and wisdom, you continually call us back to your fold. For your holy and gracious persistence, we are grateful, and we humbly ask that you will accept our confession. With the help of your Holy Spirit, may we prayerfully follow in your calls to faithfulness. You call us to serve and to pray for others, and with that in mind, we pray for all those who are grappling with the ongoing pandemic. We pray for those on the front lines, and we continue to pray for those who are fighting this disease. As a new administration begins to shepherd the direction of our nation, especially our response to the COVID crisis, we pray for efficacious strategies for beating back this disease that has killed so many of our country men and women. We pray for those who are grieving. We do acknowledge and give praise that the outgoing administration instituted a crash program to develop vaccines, but we now need ingenuity and imagination to make sure shots are in arms and that we will be rapidly on our way to herd immunity. And for those of us waiting to be vaccinated, grant us patience and safety. We pray for continued peace around the globe and for the vaccination efforts with our global neighbors to also go smoothly. We pray especially for those who don't have enough enough to eat, enough to provide shelter, enough to provide security. God of abundance, help us who have much to share and be grateful in what we can lend to brothers and sisters. And we pray, O oh Lord, for your church. May we be agents of mercy and healing. May our calling to discipleship lead us to understand our place in the building of your holy kingdom. And may our position in it be one of greatness or humility, be a part of your will for the cosmos. Oh Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may minister in your name, with your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey, we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now let us pray together as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet, like you, among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command." Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet, the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded, the prophet to speak, that prophet will die. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, George. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark's gospel, the first chapter, verses 21 through 28. Here again, God's word for you and for me. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. 
But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This, too, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be good in your sight, so that we might be faithful in your name. Amen. Well, it seems like longer, but it was just one month ago that we turned the page to a new year. We knew the world wouldn't change just immediately when the clock struck midnight, and we were finally out of the decade that was 2020. But still, there's something important about claiming a new moment in time. During those first few days of 2021, a group of my friends had a virtual conversation about the new year. It's hard to think back, but we didn't know then what even the rest of this one month would bring. A surge in the coronavirus, a violent insurrection in our nation's capital, and what feels like more examples day after day of a culture in which everything seems contentious. Then this group of friends was just focused on what we hoped for, what we hoped would be different in 2021. Instead of making resolutions and saying, we're going to do this or not do this in the new year, everyone in the group was choosing a word for 2021 as a sort of guiding theme. I had never done this before, but maybe some of you have. So the idea is that instead of taking on or giving up a behavior, you look back at the experience of the previous year and you choose a new focus, a word to give you new perspective in theory, to guide everything you do in the new year. I was amazed by the words this group chose. Nobody said anything about achievement. No one said a goal. No one named success. No one was really focused on their jobs. One friend chose the word courage because she has felt so much fear for the last 11 months. Another friend said equity. He's been working hard to understand racial injustice, and he's trying to hold himself accountable for his role in creating a more equitable world. Somebody said energy. The group nodded. She's tired. She's tired of the mundanity of days that feel the same. She's tired of worrying, of wondering when we'll be on the other side of the pandemic, and she's tired of making decisions to try to keep her family safe, and she's tired of feeling like she has to be ready to defend those decisions at any moment. One person who happens to work in healthcare said hope. She's grieving the loss of people she knows and people she doesn't know from coronavirus, and she named that she needs something in the future besides illness and death. Several of my friends on this group call chose the word truth to frame the new year. Putting politics aside for a minute, we live in a world where even an international health crisis has become a battleground. We're way past the dawn of alternative facts and fake news, and it's now become normal to call our preferences truth. We know all about the echo chamber effect in our lives, but we still seek sources and friends who agree with us. Everything feels like it could be a fight. How to stop the virus, vaccines and rollouts, what's best for kids in schools, elections, leaders. I'm sorry to say that we're even in a fight, not just about how to pursue racial justice, but whether our society is still inequitable. In this time, we crave truth, capital T. I chose the word clarity 
because so much about life seems to have changed. So I long for clarity about what I should do in lots of parts of my life, caring for our parents and our kids, how to be faithful in situations nobody has faced before, how to be a good neighbor. An interesting thing happened as this group went around and shared their words. Every person's word resonated with every other person. There were lots of nods. There were chuckles as people realized that someone had named their own experience. It was like we'd had a collective experience of the last year and we're just naming it in pieces. Someone said something about the wildness of 2020, but as I listened, I heard us describing a wilderness experience. We're all longing for courage, equity, energy, hope, clarity, and truth. Every one of those words says something about what we've been feeling. We've been feeling chaos around us, and we long for order. For Christians, that order comes from God. It comes through God's authority, authority that's stronger than forces of chaos and any competing claim, authority that can come to us even in the wilderness. There are actually lots of wilderness stories in the Bible. God's people and even Jesus Christ have found themselves in chaotic and dangerous places. God's people have felt weary and lost, uncertain about where to go, what to do, when it would end. They've fought with each other in those times and tried to find easy ways out. And in the wilderness, when chaos is around, false prophets, false gods, false spirits try to claim authority, even using lies to get power. God's people have sometimes listened to those voices that were not God. Both of our scriptures for this morning have that kind of wilderness experience as their backdrop. And they're both about God breaking into our wilderness with authority over our lives. In the text that George just read from Deuteronomy, the Israelites are facing a future without Moses. Moses, that Chad and Eric just sang about, has been their leader and God's prophet. He brought them God's law and God's covenant. He's walked with them through their journey from slavery in Egypt to liberation by God, then through their long wilderness wandering toward the land God promised them. It hasn't been an easy journey. They've been tempted, tempted to give up the work, tempted to stop walking, tempted to believe that God's promise wasn't real, or it was just too far away. To make it. As they face a transition without the prophet they've trusted, they long for clarity, just as I have in this disordered year. The Israelites are understandably concerned about how they'll recognize a prophet or a word that isn't from God, how they'll tell which one is and which one isn't. After all, if we think back, they've already given in to temptation. They put their trust in false gods and worshipped idols. So Moses, in this text in Deuteronomy, is cautioning them not to listen to every voice. Moses reminds them that God raises up prophets and gives them the words to speak. But God's prophets will not be the ones clamoring for microphones and saying they speak for God. They won't demand trust in any personality or any political power or any possession. Moses reminds the Israelites of how God's authority looks and to trust only in it. In Mark's gospel, if we turn to our second text, we see this authority of God in action. I want to go back for a minute and put this morning's reading, gospel reading, into context because so much happens so quickly just before it. Mark is maybe a gospel just made for the tone of our time. It's urgent and restless. There isn't much background. Uh, There are flourishes in the language. 
Each sentence packs a punch and it propels us forward. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is a man on a mission. So as the gospel begins, which was just a few verses ago, if you look back into the gospel, it starts with John the Baptist, who is in the wilderness. Just as the prophet Isaiah foretold, he's a voice crying out, calling for people to repent so that they can be forgiven by the coming Savior. Just a couple of weeks ago, we picked up the next section, which is Jesus being baptized by John and the River Jordan being blessed by God, who calls him beloved. Immediately, Jesus is then driven into the wilderness himself. And he withstands 40 days of testing, living with wild animals around him, being cared for and upheld by angels from God. Jesus came out of that wilderness experience and went right about his ministry. So here we have two more wilderness experiences, or even three, back to back. When we look at them together, they're helpful. They're hopeful for us in uncertain times, especially times that don't have a foreseeable end. We see from these wildernesses that God is present even when we are in the wilderness. We remember that eventually wilderness journeys come to an end. And we see that after wilderness comes something new. New life, new faith, new covenant, new ministry. We don't go backward into wilderness. We trust in God to go through it, just as Jesus did. Just last week, we picked up with Jesus calling his first four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, who left their fishing jobs to immediately follow this prophet who preached that the kingdom of God was near. And this morning, we pick up with the very next verse. Jesus and his new small group of four go to the synagogue in Capernaum, and Jesus begins to teach. The gospel writer doesn't tell us what Jesus said, but he emphasizes that the people who heard Jesus' teaching were astounded because he taught as one with authority, not as the scribes they were used to hearing. This will be a theme throughout Mark's gospel. People who hear Jesus will struggle to recognize him and to understand his urgent message So the gospel repeatedly demonstrates that no matter what other voices claim authority, Jesus is the one with authority. He is truth made flesh. In this scene, we see that authority come to action over against two different kinds of competing authorities. First, Jesus' teaching is in direct contrast from what the scribes have been teaching. Now, scribes were temple authorities. They had the job of teaching the scriptures and preserving tradition. But Mark's gospel emphasizes that Jesus is offering a new teaching. And unlike the scribes, he has authority. Jesus did not come to repeat old messages or elevate the tradition. He's not preserving the status quo. Jesus has come out of the chaos of his wilderness to proclaim a new world order, the kingdom of God that will flip the powers of empire on their heads and liberate all who are oppressed. So everyone who hears him is amazed, and they're inspired because they're hearing something different. Authority here carries sort of a double meaning. It has both the connotation of permission and that of power. So if we think back, Moses cautioned the Israelites to listen only to a prophet who has permission, one who's been sent by God. And here we have the Savior sent by God, sent to speak truth to the world. Jesus also has power in this scene as he turns from teaching to an act of healing a miracle in the synagogue. 
Mark's gospel says that just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus drives that spirit out of the man. Now, this scene might make us feel uncomfortable. We don't quite know what to make of an unclean spirit inside a person who walks into a church, a spirit that recognizes who Jesus is and calls him the Holy One of God, a spirit who fights against Jesus' power, who doesn't want to be removed from the person it is in. Over time, there have been a lot of problematic and troubling interpretations of what an unclean spirit is here. It's been characterized as a demon. It's been used to stigmatize physical and mental illness, to shun people, to subject them to all manner of humiliation. It's been interpreted as physical uncleanliness and moral depravity but we can put those dehumanizing interpretations aside. We know that illness is a medical issue, that God does not love you more if you just took a shower, and that this is not a demon invasion scene out of science fiction or fantasy. And yet, we also know that there are forces that take root in us, in individuals and in communities, forces that are not from God. Whatever it is that is inside the man who enters the synagogue, it is denying that person his voice. It is seeking to control him, not to liberate him. It estranges him from community and even from himself. We don't have to look for cartoonish demons here because we know that forces take hold inside of us too. I hesitate to list any because they can take such different forms, these destructive things that separate us from God. But I remember the temptations Jesus faced in the wilderness, empty promises of easy ways out. I think of the wilderness journey of the Israelites from slavery to a promised land and how they turned on one another and trusted in false gods. I think of the discourse in our country in the last year, filled with name-calling and blame. I think of racial hatred that still holds fast and does not want to be driven out of hearts and minds. I think of the ways so many have tried to cope with uncertainty and fear during this pandemic time. I think of the powerful hold of addiction and the trauma of abuse. There's so many forces that keep us apart from God and each other and tell us that we're not beloved, forces that wear us down, forces that hold tightly to us. And sometimes, especially when we feel we're wandering in the wilderness, we give authority to those forces. But Jesus is one with authority Over all of those things, Jesus has come to liberate us from them, just as he healed the man in the synagogue at Capernaum. Remember, the people who saw it were amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Friends, We're living through a time that often feels like it is just too much. Too much illness, fear, grief, hate, uncertainty, and noise masquerading as truth. All at once. I can't say, wish I could, can't say when the pandemic will be contained or when we'll finally live into God's vision of reconciliation and justice. I don't know how long we'll have to keep walking this particular path. I will say, if you don't find yourself in a hard space today, maybe this is a call to you to be light and hope for someone who does. But if you do find yourself in a wilderness, 
there is good, life-giving news for the journey. God is with us on it. God came with authority and power to heal us from all the forces that hold us. God came to save us and to right this world. God is still at work. And through even this wilderness, God is making all things new, even us. Thanks be to God. Amen. To search for something true and I was almost there when I met you Sooner than my fate was wrote Higher power I did devote Sins and sorrow release into the air When I awoke you were standing there fell through sky around was anything but blue found as I regained my feet wound across my memory no amount of stitches would repair and I awoke you were standing there There's no fortune in the end of the road that has no end. There's a return into the spoils once, spoil the thought of them. There's no falling back asleep once, you're waking from this dream. Yet I'm rested and I'm ready, rested and I'm ready to begin. the search for something real traded what I know for how I feel the ceiling and the walls collapsed but the bastard I was trapped as the last breath was drawn from me like broken brought me to my feet There's no fortune at the end of the road that has no end. There's no return into the sports once, spoil the thought of them. There's no falling back asleep once, you're waking from this dream. Yet I'm rested and I'm ready. Rested and I'm ready. I'm rested and I'm ready. Rested and I'm ready. I'm rested and I'm ready. Rested and I'm ready to begin. Amen. Music for the journey ahead. 
Friends, as we journey away from this time of worship and to whatever comes next, may we trust only in the authority of God. And may we take comfort because whatever wilderness we walk through, God walks with us, working in us to make things new. So for your journey, may the love and peace of Jesus Christ guard your hearts and guide your steps this day and always. Amen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. For more video content, I'd encourage you to visit our website, firstpressatl.org. We'd love to see you here sometime at the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street to join us for worship. Thanks again for watching.